Our scripture lesson today comes from Mark, the sixth chapter, beginning at verse 1 through 13. He left that place and came to his hometown. His disciples followed him, and on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were astonished. And they said, where did this man get all of this? What is this wisdom that he has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph, and Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor except in their hometown, and among their own kin and in their own house. And he could not do deeds of power there except that he laid hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went about among the villages teaching, and he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. And he said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. And if any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake the dust off of your feet as a testimony against them. And so he went out and proclaimed that all should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. The word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Our gracious God, we are so thankful for your love and grace that has brought us to this place today. We're thankful for the ways in which you continue to work in our hearts and our lives. But Lord, we are far from perfect, and there is so much that yet needs to be done. We're thankful, dear God, that you continue to work with us, to mold us and to shape us, that you send your Holy Spirit to challenge us and to help us, dear God, to see beyond the obvious. We pray, dear God, that you would bless during this time, that, Lord, you might speak to our hearts and draw us close, we pray, to your Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I hope you've been having a good celebration and uh, Fourth of July weekend holiday. It's been an exciting time, plenty of good food and time to relax and to be with family and friends, and I know that we've all enjoyed the activities. I do want to say that whoever's praying for rain can stop for a while. Uh, We've had enough uh, for for now, but we are thankful for God at sending the showers and uh, and for the, the time of celebration. It's It's important to remember why we do these things. And we celebrate our freedom, we celebrate our country, and we sometimes forget the price that was paid. You know, they didn't call it a revolution for nothing. It took a lot of time and effort. It took a lot of sacrifice. Uh, People gave up so much and people died in order that we might have the country that we have today. And so we come with that sense of gratitude and realizing that, you know, we can't be smug. We can't just sit back and say, oh, we have it made and everything is wonderful. We are so fortunate that we have two oceans that protect us from a lot of the violence of the world, violence that is increasingly coming more and more to our doorsteps. Uh, There are people today that do not love us. And they fact, they think we're demonic. ISIS has a very strong hold in the Middle East and seemingly continues to grow. And even among our own disillusioned youth, they gain an entrance into their hearts and their minds. And the very people that have enjoyed the freedoms of this country turn on it and betray it. Now you might wonder, well, what does this have to do with the 4th of July and the scripture that I've just read. Again, I'm always amazed at how God uses scripture to speak to the human condition. I have decided long ago that I'm going to be a Bible preacher. And by that I mean I preach the Bible. If you want the five steps to happiness, you'll have to go someplace else. If you want to find out how to have a good job or a good marriage, Uh, You know, my prayers are with you, but I'm not, that's not who I am. 
I'm preaching the Bible, and the Bible has something to say to us. Now, one of our difficulties when we read the Bible is that we read it in, in verse and chapter. And we fail to understand that the Bible, when it was originally written, didn't have any divisions. It wasn't divided into convenient books and paragraphs and chapters and verses. And that's why people sometimes, they love to pick out a verse, and boy, they'll hit you over the head with it constantly. But they fail to read the rest of it. And today is a classic example. It's seemingly two complete different stories if you read it with just verse and paragraph. But yet, if you look at it as a whole, it speaks to us about the condition of who we are as human beings and what we need to be about as called Christians of faith. Jesus is beginning his ministry. He's starting to do the things that God has laid upon his heart and called him to do, and that is to proclaim the kingdom of God and call for people to repent. Now notice I said repent. He didn't call us to feel good. He didn't call us to have self-actualization. He didn't call us to have all these other things that the world calls about. He calls us to repent, to turn our hearts and our lives over to him. And so he goes home. Now, we've all been home before, haven't we? You know, the older you get, the harder it is to go home. It's hard because you have so many different memories. You have those good memories, but you know, you also have some bad memories. I wasn't always a good boy, and I'm not going to tell you about that. <laughs> and sometimes when I go home, I see those people who know that I wasn't a good boy, <laughs> and it's rough. You can also find it difficult to go home when the world has changed you. If you've traveled in the world, if you've experienced different cultures, if your mind has been expanded through education and, and intelligence and intellect, and you've learned some things of the world that perhaps others don't know, you find difficulty. And so it was that Jesus went home and if he'd kept his mouth shut, he might have been okay. <laughs> but he went to the synagogue and he started preaching. And suddenly, they started questioning. Now, who is this? Isn't this, not Joseph's son, isn't this Mary's boy, you know, the illegitimate one? You know, isn't that... I once had a 75-year-old man confess to me something that a 70-year-old organist had done. And I thought, who cares? You know, some of this stuff you've got to turn loose. Those townspeople still knew that Jesus, as far as they were concerned, son of God or what, eh, he was still, he was still questionable. And so they started complaining. Do you know of anyone that complains in the church? Hmm? I'm afraid we're all guilty of that. Gandhi, when he was asked about whether Christianity was worthwhile, he said, I like your Christ, Gandhi said. I don't like your Christians because your Christians are so unlike your Christ. And suddenly, Jesus discovered that he couldn't do anything there. That his ministry had come to a stop because he healed a few, but he couldn't do what he wanted to do and could have done because of people's criticism and disbelief. When I read that, I realize that I too, I have my critical nature. 
And if I'm not careful, I can let that get in way of what it means to be Christian and what my purpose in life is all about. And that is to be a part of God's kingdom. And so what does Jesus do? He, he, what, does he, what does he do? He, he simply takes his disciples and he commissions them to go out into the community. Two by two. And notice what he says. He says, don't take anything with you. Don't take any provisions. Don't take any security. No program. No plan of salvation. Don't take any of these things. Simply go to people and ask them that they repent and give them the message of Jesus Christ. And they went. And scripture says great miracles were performed as they went from village to village. And he said, now if you go someplace and they don't receive you, don't worry about it. Just shake the dust off and keep on moving. You see, if we're not careful, Jesus can move on and we not even know it. We're left with an empty shell. We're left with our ritual. We're left with our traditions. We're left with our museum. And we're not what God has called us to be. I read the story of a minister that was visiting a large, or what used to be large, church in a metropolitan area. The church at one time ran almost a thousand people. They were down to 50 people sitting in that sanctuary all by themselves Sunday after Sunday, no kids, no youth, trying to keep a building alive that was bigger and more demanding than their resources would permit. And they got a preacher that came in and he wasn't the total, the, the total secret or, or reason for their renewal. But the man who was telling this preacher the story said he came in and he did a few simple things. First, he preached the Bible and he got people to reading the Bible. And he built community of faith. Now they're running over 500 people. It says something about the simplicity of the gospel. It doesn't take a lot to change the human heart. It, it does take God. And sometimes with all of our efforts and all of our programs, if we don't speak to the heart, then we've missed the point. There is a sacrifice that we are all called to make. And on this 4th of July celebration weekend, we are called to make a sacrifice and to realize what we do is important. Earlier, I mentioned that ISIS is a growing threat in our world, and it is for a simple reason. It's not because it has any value it's not because what it's talking about is worthy. ISIS and its cruelty and hatred is pure evil. But they have one thing that we have lost, and that is focus. They are focused on what they are to do, and they are doing it. Today, I was saddened to learn again this past week that what has captivated American culture is whether you should put peas in guacamole. So we have lost our focus, friends. We get so sidetracked by the stars and by the personalities that we fail to understand and appreciate who we are and what we have call, are called to be. And we are called to be the ambassadors for Christ, followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is our focus. That is why we are here today, to put God first and foremost. And every time we take Holy Communion, it should remind us that we are a part 
of that family of God and that we are focused on a task that is before us. So I invite you to prepare your heart as you come and partake of this holy meal and remember once more that God's love is great and his grace is bountiful and he wants us to be a part of his kingdom. Will you follow him?